everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Today, I think we're going to have a fun um, program. It's going to be at least pretty one that we can ooh and all ah at the beautiful fall flowers. So welcome to Florida's Fall Flower Power. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities. Um, I work for the water department here in water conservation. And my email address, if you would like a PDF copy, as always, of this program, um, please email me anytime at lilyb, L I L L Y B, at Hernando County dot us. And we can, I'll be glad to send you that PDF copy. Here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And we're going to cover, I put these fall leaves over the one we're going to cover a lot today, which is right plant, right place. Um, a lot of the others will fall into place as well, but we're going to cover those beautiful fall bloomers and talk about fall in Florida. So probably a good many of us um, I've been in Florida most of my life. I've been in Florida since I was 11, but I do have the, that first decade of life. I remember, you know, the beautiful fall days. And of course, with me only being a child when I left the Pittsburgh area. So you retain those wonderful, beautiful memories of the beautiful fall, sunny days. And, you know, you wore your scarf and your sweater and went out and got apples and you know and we can still do those things there are places you know just an eight hour drive 10 hour drive from here and many of us do that we will go um you know celebrate fall for at least a week or so uh in georgia north carolina tennessee somewhere around there you know and have those wonderful experiences again and in those mountainy places or even further north, fall, you can't not know that it's fall. Fall slaps you in the face and says it's fall and you feel that crisp air and you see the beautiful leaves. And then we retain those memories we may have had of those gorgeous fall days or that gorgeous fall day. Um, but let's remember, there's a reason we're here. <laughs> There's a reason we're in Florida. So when we want to hold on to those gorgeous memories, we got to remember this is also what comes along, you know, the gray days, the nasty, icky, wet, cold days. So, you know, there's a reason that we're in Florida. And even though we don't have fall, like I said, that smacks you in the face and says it's fall now, I've been here long enough you know, I can feel the, feel the seasons and I know I can tell the season differences. And sometimes some of my Northern relatives will ask me, well, how? And, you know, uh, you'll see memes on Facebook that says, you know, it's September 21st. What does that mean? Nothing. In Florida, it means nothing. September 21st might not mean much, but when you get around October-ish, yes, you can feel a difference. It's not you don't have it, you know, hit you as soon as you walk out the door. But there are ways to know that it is fall. Um, the sun is lower in the sky, you know, just like fall everywhere. The your shadows are longer, kind of elongated shadows. Um, obviously, our daylight hours are shorter. And our plants respond to that um, shorter daylight hours. Our lawn stops actively or slows down its active growth. So do a lot of other plants. It is a little bit less humid. I'm not saying, you know, by Halloween, when you try to go out with the grandkids or whatever, you're not going to be <laughs> sweating to death. But in general, you know, it is less humid. We experienced kind of a sudden fall this week. And, you know, we here in Hernando are, or anywhere that was not affected by Hurricane Ian, are somewhere in the middle of wanting to enjoy this cooler weather and feeling guilty for the reason <laughs> that it came about. Um, but, you know, all we can do is hope that those without the power or anything at least are also, you know, 
not it's not overly hot, you know, for them. And also we do have deciduous um, plants that do lose their leaves. And I'm sure there are other ways that many people who have been here for a long period of time um, you know, know that it's fall. So if you want to enjoy, you know, share some of that in the chat, we will get uh, to the chat at the end of the program as well. But one of the ways we can enjoy fall, and also, you know, me as a horticultural enthusiast, you know, can tell by the different flowers that are blooming that it's fall now. So, but there are many ways to bring in that fall color. We're always looking to bring in that fall color. Nature brings in that fall color up north. We can get a change of leaf color, things like that, but generally, <laughs> it's usually around Christmas maybe around January. And what I have noticed is um, the wetter, if their trees, particularly if they are in a swamp, if they are, if their feet are really wet, you'll see some color change with those. Um, but there are other ways that we can enjoy fall, enjoy the season and um, bring that color into our landscape. So before you do that, you wanna check your available space as always before you're going to want to bring in new plants. Decide how much maintenance and work you wanna do. That will determine whether you're going to bring in some perennials, you know, or maybe a little bit of fun with some annuals. Research the plants to get exactly what you want and what you're looking for. That's kind of why you're all listening to this. And plan before you buy. Another way I say that is plan before you plant. I am guilty of not doing that, but it will save you money and, and you know, be more organized in the process. So let's first start with some native, native blooming plants that we have in the fall um, here in Central Florida. Some of you may be listening um, from the East Coast. I did see, um, that the uh, Kennedy Space Center Garden Club shared this class. So welcome if you're listening from that area and probably a lot of uh, the plants that I'm talking about will also apply you know, to your area as well. Let's first start with one of my favorites, um, swamp sunflower. It's also called narrow leaf um, sunflower. This was my yard, it was either last year, or I'm thinking it was two years ago. This plant is so prolific. It is a short-lived perennial as far as how much it'll bloom. Um, I get these blooming more in November. Um, at Thanksgiving, they were blooming beautifully. This year, I have probably three times as many of these, uh, the stalks. They're really densely clumped together, filling in this area now. So they are incredible self-spreaders. These clumps, you know, before they get the flowers on them, look like green cousinets to me, <laughs> filling up this plant bed. Um, so it does form very dense colonies. Um, it does attract birds, bees, and butterflies. It's pretty tall, about four to six inches. Now, I have this on this slide, but this goes for all of these plants that you might be looking for. And at the end, I will give you some resources to where maybe you can find some of these plants. Um, but you wanna look for Florida ecotypes. If you just start going online and put narrow leaf sunflower, you might be able to find some seeds and they may have this exact same botanical name, but if you're getting them from Michigan, the ecotype is just going to be slightly different. So try to, you know, source out local, as local as you can, um, sources for these plants or for seeds. Um, Florida Wildflower um, Association or um, floridawildflowers.org. Um, they have, and I have the link at the end, you know, sources to get seeds for this. You can also hit up any native Plant nurseries you can find, keep your ear open. I try to share as many of them on my Facebook as I know of. Um, 
and also um, our master gardeners in Hernando County have a nursery. I'll talk about that at the end with a lot of these native plants and some really great Florida friendly non-natives as well. Here's another one. This is everywhere right now. People may say this is a weed. Well, it's a weed that these bumblebees are in love with. And I see it, them growing wild around my neighborhood. And I really became attracted to them. They are intensely interesting kind of plants. This um, dotted horse mint, or they also call it spotted bee balm, which I tend to uh, refer to it as the bee balm because you cannot ever go to a patch of these and not find bumblebees. They're just going to be all over it. And like I said, it's growing wild in the um, undeveloped areas in my neighborhood. The sad part is, though, there are getting to be less and less undeveloped areas in my neighborhood. So I actually purchased some so I can have some in my yard um, to at least have it available there. I plan on, you know, expanding my um, how many bee bombs I have in the in the future. I also did see a whole bunch of this. Um, there, I got to be involved in a kind of a fun situation with our marine agent and a um, entomologist from the University of Florida, as well as um, the director of the Osceola County Extension Office. He lives here. He's a drone operator, so that, that's why his involvement was there. Um, they have released some thrips that will hopefully make a dent in our invasive plant of Brazilian pepper. Those thrips have been vetted for 12 years or so to make sure they don't eat or damage anything else. But we have a lot of the Brazilian pepper in our coastal area that in a um, kind of a pit for utilities, not pit as in hole in the ground, but where they, you know, dump stuff. And um, so I got to be involved because I've got key <laughs> to get in there. And um, I helped release these thrips. All that to say in the midst of all this invasive Brazilian pepper that was there, there was tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of this bee balm. So I was very happy, you know, to see that you know, making a dent in where all that in those invasive plants were. Um, interesting thing about them is they may have some microbial and antiseptic um, and antifungal properties. I don't know how to, you know, um, pull that out of these plants, but that's what they say they do. And they can get pretty tall, one to four feet tall, and they are native throughout Florida. And these can be found, like I said, I bought some, and I'm pretty sure I bought it at the um, Master Gardener Nursery. And you can find it at native plant um, sales and nurseries as well. Here's another thing. Um, it's interesting to me where I live um, on the neighborhood Facebook group, sometimes always this time of year because of these beautiful berries. They'll take pictures of this American Beauty berry and they'll be like, what is this? Because it's everywhere, but then they notice it when it's so pretty. It grows naturally. I have never had to purchase one. I'm just, you know, where where I live, it's very, very sandy where I live. I live an east about a mile off of US 19. So it's pretty far west in the county. It's very sandy. But let me tell you, this beauty berry, and the beauty berry likes any kind, it will do fine in more moist hammock areas as well, but it likes my upland pine wood areas very much. And when um, I we purchased our house, it was on a half an acre, and the back quarter acre was kind of was left alone. And so I still have a lot of beauty berries coming up all over there. And over the years, I have uh, transplanted them, some of them, not all of them, and. They can make very distinguished looking small trees in the civilized part of your yard, as well as growing wild as an understory tree. And um, in the spring, they will have very small, usually either white or pink flowers, like at each node. 
And then this time of year is when they have these fantastic berries. And as proof that the birds will eat them, <laughs> Master Gardener Diana just took this this week at her house. So I told her I'm stealing your picture of this mockingbird um, hanging out there on the beautyberry. And um, she said, you know, was eating it. Generally, the birds don't wait, don't worry if these beautiful purple berries start turning black. Um, the birds really like them at that point when they become beauty berry raisins because they don't have a high sugar content. And apparently they probably taste better when they have more concentrated of sugar. People do uh, make jams and uh, jellies out of this. You can find that online. Um, I'll just tell you, and I've seen, a, you know, that pops up all the time this time of year. I'll tell you, get a lot of sugar. <laughs> um, you know, it's edible, but it's not all that sweet on its own, but it makes absolutely a gorgeous landscape plant. Now we have this coral honeysuckle. So much prettier, this native, than the Japanese honeysuckle um, that's, you know, eating everything up north. It's become invasive up there. Of course, what are you going to have with your red tubular flowers? You're going to have hummingbirds. This um, gorgeous uh, coral honeysuckle was, uh, belonged to a master gardener at her home. The master gardener is no longer with us. Um, but I'm hoping that her coral honeysuckle is still, you know, honoring her and, and thriving. Um, it grows in many, many places. This is one thing I haven't tried yet in my yard, but I'm always looking for new, new things. So, you know, in my future, I hope to see some coral honeysuckle in my yard. It does bloom throughout the year, but it, it is happiest in the cooler, drier times in the winter. And any kind of soil, really. And you're, you know, you're going to need something like Norma Jean had here to, to hold it up and let it grow. And it doesn't seem to freeze back, at least, you know, not significantly. This is another blooming beauty this time of year. It grows naturally in you know, where I live. I don't think I would be very successful at trying to transplant any of it. And so I don't want to move them, but you, there are seeds available for these from that um, uh, that FloridaWildflowers.org, the um, growing co-op that they have. You might also be able to find them at native nurseries. Um, they're they're just gorgeous, Blazing Star, or uh, Liatris. This particular one is Liatris picata. It's also known as dense gay feather. It, um, this, the way uh, it's described, it seems to like really wet areas, but my type, which might not be this piccata, uh, you know, it might be just slightly different, really grows in those sandy pine wood type of areas. And it is blooming right now. It attracts bees, butterflies, and beneficial, all kind of beneficial insects. And it gets to be about, I've never seen them five feet tall. Usually they stay within the one to two feet range. <laughs> Here's another beautiful late fall bloomer that can bring a lot of color to um, your landscape. And it prefers, you know, really even into Christmas, it can um, stay blooming. It can be, it can sucker fairly aggressively. You know, it grows like a vine. Um, it will have pollinators all over it. And it, you know, can get to be about four, four feet or taller. Like I said, late fall. So really you're looking at a holiday bloomer from Thanksgiving through Christmas. It, it has very fragrant. Um, the formal, former Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Program Assistant from Pasco County, who I used to do classes with, Frank Galdo, he insists, this is probably his favorite plant, and he insists that it smells like baking sugar cookies <laughs> to him. So it really has that whole holiday feel. 
while being, you know, absolutely gorgeous in your yard. Now, goldenrod. People may look at this and squinch up their nose, either thinking it's just a weed or it gives me allergies. Goldenrod is pollinated by insects. There is not much of it blowing around in the in wind. It's not getting up your nose. What um, the pollen that you're getting allergies from are its um, less nice friend. <laughs> we all have one of those friends who maybe you don't want to be seen out in public with. Well, goldenrod gets seen out in public with ragweed, gets mixed in there, and therefore gets blamed for the stuff the ragweed does. <laughs> so goldenrod is not giving you the allergies. That, that's the ragweed out there. This was growing by my house by itself. I didn't put it there. Um, kind of in the lot next door and moving into our house, which so then we bought a lot next door. Um, so it comes up naturally, um, bright yellow in the late fall, in the late summer, fall and winter. It can be pretty tall, makes even a nice, uh, you know, if you're looking for some kind of barrier, maybe between you and your neighbors. It attracts bees, small butterflies and other pollinators and is a nectar source for many of the pollinators. And there's different types of goldenrod as well. I just am assuming I have the pine barren because of where I live in the dry sandy pine woods area. Here's another great, great, great pollinator attractor. And this brings color to your yard most of the year. And I planted a fire bush uh, in 2020, when we were all home, um, staying home as much as possible, uh, you know, quarantining. And it was small, you know, a foot tall. The next year it grew uh, maybe three feet tall. This year, my husband, you know, moved his grill, <laughs> some other stuff, and is slightly complaining that the fire bush is taking over that whole corner. But he also since he's retired now, and this is right outside our bedroom window, he likes to kind of lounge there and watch the hummingbirds. He tells me about 8.30 every morning, hummingbirds are all over this. He does this because, you know, 8.30 every morning, I am in my cubicle here at work. I can't watch these <laughs> hummingbirds like he can. So I'm glad I gave him <laughs> something to enjoy. And it is just a gorgeous um, plant, bees, Bumblebees um, and other bees, honeybees, um, wasps, hoverflies, sulfur um, butterflies absolutely adore this, the yellow butterflies. And I believe because I have a lot of naturally growing partridge pea in that back undeveloped area, and that's the host plant for the sulfur, the yellow sulfur butterflies. So then they come and nectar all over this. I have some really great pictures of bumblebees that have their head all the way inside these tubes, you know, getting getting out that great pollen and nectar. Easy to grow and fairly easy to find nowadays, but be careful when you are finding them because you want to this is one time when the um, a lot of these natives, that's why I'm including the botanical names for you. Uh, you know, it's very important because there are all there are, you know, cultivated natives, which can be okay. If you really, really want a smaller one of these, look for the um, native cultivar. I can't remember its name, but just make sure that it is the native cultivar. Otherwise, there are non-native varieties of firebush. Why does that matter? Um, matters for a couple of reasons. One of them is that they are interbreeding with our native firebush. So eventually, maybe we won't have any, you know, pure natives left. And um, the more hybridized a plant gets, the less the pollinators are going to recognize it as a plant because we're moving evolution faster 
than you know than those pollinators can deal with. They're not evolving as quick as we humans are evolving the plants. So they might not be as attractive and might not be attractive at all. So that's why we always try and stay, you know, as purely native as possible. Now there are plenty of non-natives out there that are attractive to pollinators, but you also have to consider, I like to have a large percentage of natives in my yard. I'm not a purist that must have 100% natives because that gets hard <laughs> to do but a a huge percentage of natives will be very 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 beneficial it, it's it's like the difference between giving your child you know a healthy meal or just letting them eat dessert all the time that's the best way I can describe it your native plants are the healthy meal some of those non-natives may be more like dessert so and this up here in central Florida, it's gonna freeze. <laughs> it froze last year. But like I said, it came back and then really is just gorgeous in that corner. So <clears throat> it will freeze, but it will come back. This native is one of the ones that you can go into a big box store and find. So that's nice, but you Want to be careful, and I'm going to say this when we get to the part about annuals. If you're shopping in a big box store, please inquire if any of these um, are have been treated with any kind of pesticide or have a systemic pesticide or are near heavily pesticide laden plants. Because if you bring them into your yard and you're trying to attract wildlife and pollinators, you don't want to bring poisons you know, into your yard, into that environment. But this muley grass, I took this picture last year and it's blooming, I think, very late. This year, mine is hardly purple like this at all yet. But I think I did take this on Thanksgiving day. So, you know, I still have some time. There's the beautiful muley grass. And here's my whole combination of natives and non-natives. Native muley grass, non-native kind of it's a purple, dark purple, fountainy, stocky thing that I got at the Master Gardener Nursery. It's almost black. It's so dark purple. It's very millet like um, in its structure. And here's that narrow leaf sunflower on the other side of the fence. Hiding behind it, you can see the beauty berry berries. So, native, 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 non native, and then this, which I could pretend to you was a cedar, <laughs> red cedar, because I have a ton of those in my yard, but this particular one is a non-native Arizona cypress. That was a Christmas tree of mine at one point, but I just love the whole color combination going on there. Here's uh, another one that grows naturally. I've never had to buy beautyberry. I've never had to buy purple love grass. It grows naturally where I live and lots of it. And both of those have transplanted very, very well. I have never had a beautyberry transplant fail. I'm pretty much their weeds, <laughs> they grow fabulously. I have a whole story, if you look back on some of my other programs about the Royal Rumble um, extraordinaire that I had moving one of the <laughs> beautyberries that I had too close to my house. Long story short, it and I were having a big old fight with me trying to get it out. And I finally took an ax to its roots. <laughs> finally won, I was the victor, carried it to the backyard, planted it. It shook itself off and said, well, okay, fine, I'll grow here. It's been growing there ever since, never even showed any signs of distress after going through all that. This purple love grass, which grows all by itself in my yard, is also great to, it looks good in the more formal areas of my yard, great as a border plant. Um, you can see a bunch of this. It's really hard to capture purple lovegrass blooming um, with a photo, you know. So I've got a lot of the color here, but it's real close. So I'll just let you know, it's only, you know, gonna be like a one to two foot mound. It's not like Fakahatchee grass, which will be 
much bigger, you know, almost as tall as you are. Just little nice, nicely formed mounded grasses. So easy to transplant. Um, I move them from one part of my yard to the other and use them as border grass. Although I will tell you this purple inflorescence, which is going on right now, it looks, you know, you ferial, it looks all fairy like and, you know, beautiful. If you go down some of the roads, um, if you're in Hernando and go down Hexham Road, you'll get to see on the side of the road. I saw it this morning. There's so much of it that it just looks purple, you know, the sides of the road in, in, in groups. Um, but this purple inflorescence isn't hanging in the air, <laughs> even though it looks like it is. You'll know when it's done um, blooming its inflorescence because those tiny, tiny flowers were hang were on something and they were on these, these panicles, these flower stalks. So just like any other plant, when it's done blooming, it's going to, you know, it has seeds, it's gonna throw that off so it can spread. Well, those panicles can be maybe two feet <laughs> long and, you know, have the branches sticking out of it and they may roll around your yard like little tumbleweeds and end up at your front door. Doesn't bother me, but I'm just letting you know um, that's the kind of plant litter that you, you might experience with this purple love grass. Um, it is the larval host. We don't think of grasses and butterflies, um, but it is the larval host for the Zabulon skipper. And that's who I found a picture of it right there. And it does attract birds or the seeds. Well, now we're gonna move on to some of the non-natives that will bring um, great fall color into our yard. Fire spike. This, um, I think it can get, get even taller than six feet tall, four to six feet tall. My story was fire spike. I don't have any in my current yard. I had some years ago and I lived inland. I lived in the city of Brooksville, which is uh, a, you know, an oak hammock area. Very moist, very jungly, very clay-like soil. So um, I had a relative who owned a hardware store in Spring Hill and they had a nursery and I was given some fire spike that would pretty much look dead, you know, because he couldn't sell it anymore. And I literally just put it in the ground and it grew just fine. Um, and at that point, you could take any of these stalks, at least in the ground that I had there. Remember, I had the wet, more clay-like soil. Then don't even bother rooting it or whatever, cut it off, stick it in the ground, it would grow. It froze back every year, um, but it came back every year and had these beautiful red tubular flowers. I had hummingbirds all over it and it was in pretty deep shade. So, you know, very easy um, and fairly easy to find a flower to add to your yard and bring those hummingbirds and that red color in. Here's all kind of various species of hurricane lilies. I had no idea that all of these <laughs> You know, we're all kind of listed in this like Horus spa. Spa means species. Um, so many different um, ones you can find out there. Um, this might be one of the hurricane lilies. It's the blood lily, I believe is what it's called. Um, and there's so many different kinds out there. Even your spider lilies are in this family. They have some surprise lilies and I, they call them that because they like to come up, they're called hurricane lilies, but they like to come up like really late in the hurricane season. Apparently there are also magic lilies, resurrection lilies, naked lilies. Don't worry, you're not going to see one of those here today. Um, schoolhouse lily, Guernsey lilies. The, all these lilies, all these hurricane lilies, and guess what? They are not even lilies. They are not in the Liliaceae family at all. They are in the amaryllis family, but they're really fun um, plants to have. 
This one is also really easy to find, this African iris. This one does better in the more OCAMIC areas. In my county, in Brooksville, people have these uh, um, as border plants, and they're always dividing them and sneaking to their neighbor's house and you know throwing them at their neighbors as if you know they were zucchinis. <laughs> They don't grow quite as prolifically, you know, in the more sandy western areas of the county, but they're still, um, you know, a beautiful plant to have around, not, not a huge pollinator attractor. So they're going to be there to fill up space. Your lizards will have a great time, you know, hiding in, in the grassy leaves that this iris has. Um, so they do fulfill that function. Um, Beautiful. I mean, look at the three different colors on these African irises. And it's um, kind of ironic that they do so well in the Brooksville area because they're high school. Where I went to high school, <laughs> these are the high school colors, the purple and gold. Um, just really, you know, easy plant and provides this nice color for you and provides shelter for some little critters as well. Now, these you can have pretty much all year, except if they're going to freeze. They will freeze in the winter in here in central Florida. That's why I say um, if you're listening from South Florida, you can probably plant them right in the ground. Um, here, if you want them to survive, you know, keep them in a pot or some pots and um, move them back and forth if we're going to have a freeze. But I mean, a lot of these croton, look at that, that is your classic fall color. So if you're looking as far as for decoration um, for your yard area, you know, put something Halloween-y or fall-like, buy it. You'll bring in a lot of great fall color that way. And it's easy to find and has minimal pests to deal with. You might get some spider mites or, you know, regular house plant um, pests but overall generally easy to deal with. So now we're gonna talk about um, some annuals. And the reason I put here is sprinkle in some colorful annuals is when we're talking about annuals, of course the, the most ideal plants I cover in this program are those native ones. After that will, will be the Florida friendly so a lot of these annuals are still Florida friendly, but what you got to consider with annuals is, you know, they're expensive. You've got to buy them every year, <laughs> replace them every year. And that makes a big carbon footprint, um, not only the in the production of them, but in the shipping, all of that. So that's why I say to use annuals for a fun pop of color. It will also save you more money if you have mostly perennials. And then you choose an area like this is my fun area that I want to change out with the seasons. And also when we go back to that, how much maintenance, you know, did you want to do? So you got to consider that with the annuals. One of the ways to deal with annuals that you know are going to be like a seasonal one and done thing is this pot and pot method. It's not what you're thinking. I'm still talking about ornamental plants here. Um, <laughs> You can, you know, have pots in already in the ground where you keep your annuals and then put a slightly smaller pot of the annual right in there, cover it up with your mulch. Um, there you go, pop in, pop out, easy. Um, but again, that's going to be an intensive area that you want to maintain and spend a lot of time with. So, you know, consider the costs of that replacing the plants, the carbon footprint, all of that. But you can choose a small area where you can have fun with a pop of color. So here are the annuals. And this is why we like to tell you this because they're all the same annuals that you can get up north, but different timing. You may have already tried to do this in the summer and like, well, they just, you know, just died. Well, that's because it's the wrong time of year. So here are the things that are going to bloom fabulously in the fall into the winter um, for you. 
um, with our annuals are the delphinium or the Carolina larkspur. They grow right here. Some nice lion's ear here. Lion's ear, I'll get it. Um, look at that orange color for fall. Any of the cosmos, I put pink ones here, but you know, there are tons of different cosmos. And, um, you know, you can even get seeds for these things now and have them bloom all through the cool season for you. Coxcomb um, or Celosia. Mums, of course, chrysanthemums are the fall thing. So a lot of people like to have the baskets of those, you know, on their porch. You know, you can still do that under, but you know, by a haystack, and scarecrow, and all that. Go for it all you want. Hollyhocks will grow here in the fall. They will do better in the cool weather. Nasturtium. See, these are the things that you're used to seeing in the summer up north. Nasturtium, pansies, petunias. Cool season annuals here. And, you know, if we get some pretty good freezes, you may be the only one in the neighborhood with some nice color if you've got your pansies and petunias blooming because I've never seen it get cold enough here for them to care. It definitely get too hot for them. By May, they're going to be like, Bleh, I'm done. But all through the cool season, you can have these annuals growing marvelously. Um, Amaran, zinnias, Calendula, I just happened to capture both of them in the same place. This is a pot marigold. Um, this was up in um, Cross Creek at Marjorie Keenan Rawlings' um, home. And uh, so more in North Florida, but they, and I think it was last November. So they had the beautiful uh, zinnias and Calendula and uh, Snapdragon will grow here this time of year as well and all through the cool seasons. Kind of funny story about zinnia. I was just in Pennsylvania, so you know, visiting the Pittsburgh area. And I commented on how beautiful my sisters were. And she was just kind of squinting at me because I was saying zinnia. And she goes, oh, well, we call them zinnias. <laughs> well, okay, whatever you want to call them, but you know. <laughs> um, I, I love it there. I'm from there, but not necessarily the uh, place where you um, rely on to pronounce things correctly. Let's just say that that way. However you say it when you're from where you're from, that's great. So some of the things that you might want to be doing, you want to get out in your yard because it's so nice. By the way, I'm not promised. I've seen the 10-day forecast, which is still only getting up in the low 80s, which is fabulous. That doesn't mean it won't be 90 on Halloween. I'm sorry. I mean, that's just the way Florida is. But, you know, while we have some cool times in the day, here's some things, some chores that you might want to think about doing. Um, when, you, when the time changes, which is going to be on November 6th, and it's Sunday, November 6th, we're going to fall back. Don't forget, if you have an irrigation um, system, to also put that plot back as well. Great time to be out there weeding. Um, the weeds are actually easier to pull. They're not quite as um, aggressively holding on to the ground and their roots as you know they were in the summer. So good time to do some of that cleaning out. Great time to start creating a compost pile. We have compost bins again, yay! So we have compost classes coming up as well. And you can check out my Facebook page. If you are a um, resident in Fernando County and haven't gotten one before, um, you're welcome to attend and get a free compost bin from Fernando County Solid Waste. And it's a great time to start a cool season vegetable garden, kind of late now, to have that second warm season, you should be already into it, doing it <laughs> at this point. But near the end of the month, or even now, if you wanna start some of the seeds, great time to do a cool season um, garden. And Dr. Lester is the one to ask questions about that. In fact, they have a whole series going on right now. If you go look at Hernando Extension's Facebook page, you can see their whole series of um, 
growing vegetables here in Florida. Here are the things that we don't want you to do in the fall. Growing milkweed, particularly this tropical milkweed that I have a picture of here. Um, we don't want you to be growing that. This is a non-native, our native milkweed. I have some Asclepius tuberosa that it looks awful right now because it's senescing. It's going down for the season. It, it's done. And that's what all the native milkweeds will do because our milkweeds should not be hanging around North or Central Florida. Our milkweeds shouldn't be. Our monarchs shouldn't be hanging around North or Central Florida um, because we get freezes and they're not going to survive that. So if you have, happen to have this Asclepius parisa vaca, tropical milkweed, it's a non-native, it won't naturally senesce and go down for the season. It's just gonna keep growing until we have a freeze. And by then it's too late. You've also frozen the caterpillars, frozen the monarchs. So we ask if you have this, um, I prefer that you not, but if you do have it, cut it back right before Thanksgiving. It's gonna to try to keep coming back, but keep cutting it back until the beginning of April so that we don't run into freezing our monarchs. There are lots of other reasons, and you can look on Hernando County Government YouTube, and I have a whole class about monarchs. Um, monarchs, myths, monarchs, milkweed, and myths. That's what it's called. That's what it's called. Watch that, and I'll talk a lot about this um, tropical milkweed. You can prune the deciduous plants. That's the best time to do it, you know, in the cooler months, but don't prune anything like azaleas. Camellias, any of those spring um, blooming plants, or you will not have a spring blooming plant. You'll have a shrub with no flowers. You should have done that by like June 30th at the latest. So don't prune those or any of your herbaceous um, plants because new growth is very tender um, to frosts and freezes. So and we were talking about watering and your irrigation. Your whole yard needs way less water now than it did in the summer. So you, you can start skipping a week. You don't have to water just because it's your watering day. And it's not a time to start mowing real low so that you, you know, don't have to do it for the whole season. Watch my program from two weeks ago. Turf Talk with Bernie. Bernie, uh, that's on Hernando County Government YouTube, as well as my Facebook page. Um, he'll get in all the details of why you shouldn't mow too low. And, you know, it's a good time to do all that cleanup, like I said, but um, leaves, there's several things you can do with leaves. Um, and one of the things you shouldn't do is pay to have them thrown away. That makes, you know, no sense. They're a great mulch. Disturbing them disturbs all kinds of critters, caterpillars, all kinds of things under them that use them for winter cover. If you do have to clean them up because of your HOA or something like that, consider mulching them uh, or composting them. Instead, you know, use them for something good. Otherwise, if they're just laying there and they're not bothering anything, you know, leave those critters alone that are using it for winter cover. And um, those leaf blowers are horrible for those critters. As I was discussing um, watering, if you're in Hernando County, here's just a reminder of when your watering day is. This is year round, year after year. This is not gonna change. But again, when we have shorter daylight hours, our lawns are not growing as much. Just because my day is Monday doesn't mean I have to water on Monday. You know, let your lawn tell you when it needs watered and you're allowed to water before 8 a.m., which would be the most Florida friendly thing to do. Or that's an or, that's an or, that's an or, that's not an and after 6 p.m. Here's another thing, and I'm only showing you one because it is marvelous <laughs> right now. But don't fall for their beauty. 
I pass one on the way back and forth to work if I happen to go the back way, the prettier way. It is stunningly beautiful right now. This golden rain tree, it gets the uh, yellow flowers and then these. The one I see has even like three times shade, three shades darker than this photo shows of these bracts. Absolutely gorgeous. No one said invasive plants are not gorgeous, um, but this is an invasive exotic. You will have little golden rain trees all over the place. It will eventually start to push out our native, um, you know, trees and plants that the pollinators and the birds and all, you know, everything needs. And um, well, it will attract if you have one of these and you love its beauty, but then every spring you're like, wow, what are these black and red bugs all over my yard? So you think I'm a psychic. <laughs> how do it, how did I know you had black and red bugs all over your yard? Because you have a golden rain tree. That's how I know. And they're eating those, those are Jadera bugs, J A D E R A and they're eating the seeds of your golden rain tree. So that might be incentive in itself. You don't want all those bugs. Um, don't have the golden rain tree. Here are some of the resources that will help you in your search and journey to find some of the more elusive native plants that I talked about um, here at wildflowers.org. That's the first site you go to, and then it will direct you to where they have a growers co-op where you can buy um, some seeds. Um, you can also check out the Florida Native Plant Society and the chapter in your county. If you really, really want to go on a search for native plants, if you want to make that you know, a lifestyle, the biggest thing I can tell you to do is to befriend other people who know native plants. That's the best way to do it because you can start going to native plant meetings or, you know, and making friends and they will have the resources and be able to swap plants with you or let you know where some are. That's the best way uh, to do it. If you're looking for a native nursery in your area, this is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. You can go there and, you know, find one. Sometimes you might have to make a day trip out of it. So bring some of your friends that you made from the Native Plant Society and take a car load and go, um, you know, sometimes here we have to go all the way to Groveland, you know, to find, which is about an hour away, you know, to find a great native nursery. Um, a big one, I should say. A lot, all of them are great, but you know, a, a big one that has lots of um, choices. <clears throat> but be very careful; don't make too much of a day trip, because you still want to stay in your region. It would not make sense for us here in Hernando County to go up to Tallahassee, where Buddy is, or to go to Miami, because they're going to have different plants that might not do well in our area. So stay within you know, our 9A range. Of course, many things can be found at these gardening solutions at ifis.ufl.edu. That's the University of Florida's extension website. Thousands of answers there about many different plants you can find. And if you are local, um, the Hernando County Master Gardener is on Oliver Street in Brooksville. They are open Wednesdays, they're open right now, um, and Saturdays from 8.30 to 11. That time will be extended to 12 soon. Um, the, the 11 is their summer hours. So as soon as it's, you know, they can work till noon and not die, they, they will be doing that very soon as well. They have a lot of native and Florida friendly plants and don't use any pesticides. <clears throat> Here are my upcoming classes. On October 12th, next week, um, I won't be um, in person. I, uh, I will be in person. I won't be here online. 
in the morning because I have an in-person class um, at the Spring Hill Library. And you can email me for more information. I didn't know how timely this one would be. I've already done it online, but it's going to be very timely. Storms and trees. Um, we dodged a bullet here. Um, you know, everywhere from like Pasco County northward. So maybe we won't the next time. So you got to start really assessing what's going on in your yard. And here we will talk about storms and trees. If you can't come in person, look on Hernando County Government YouTube where I've already done it um, virtually like this. Then on the 19th, uh, Dr. Lester and I will be talking about freedom lawns. Let freedom lawns bring. And on the 26th, since it's so close to Halloween, we'll be doing creepy crawlies, the cryptic lives of Florida bugs. That one should be a lot of fun. And here are the different social media platforms that I'm on um, that you can follow me. And again, Hernando County Government YouTube, I think when this class gets posted on there, it'll be the 93rd video I have on there. So lots of things to watch on there. And that is it. So thank you. Oh, let me check out the chat. Uh, yeah, Bobby's talking about golden rain trees. She knows all about those. Okay, everyone's just saying hi. So I thank you all for joining me. And um, if you would like to join Dr. Lester and I tomorrow morning at 10, we'll both be at the virtual plant clinic. Otherwise, um, I won't see you on the 12th unless you come to Spring Hill and see me in person, but I'll see you on the 19th. Thank you and have a great Florida friendly week. <laughs>